Kid, seriously. Welcome to another heck of an episode of the Kid Seriously Show, the only podcast around that's, well... Oh hell, pitter-patter, let's get at her. Every now and again we get together to discuss the world, play our famous trivia question game show, discuss other things from Nerdland that might tickle our fancy, and once in a while, review something. To my left, it's everyone's favorite fox in the box, it's Luke Neitzel, and to my right, way to my right, it's our bird man himself, it's Mark Neitzel. Me, I'm Maya Madrid, reminding you that it'd be a lake trout, because we're on a lake, Derry. Boys, how are you? I get every single one of those references. Do you really? I do. And then you also said Fox in the Box, where I know where you're pulling that from, but was also the nickname of Mike McGee, former Chicago Fire League MVP. So you're really hitting on, on all cylinders there for me. But to answer your question, I am fine. It's, you know, Sunday night, and this seems to be working for us because we're still doing this. And it's almost been a year, which is insanity. But It's been over a year when you count the unrecorded or the unpublished episodes. That's true, but we don't talk about them because they are Episode zero is great. And, we are, and we're talking about unlistenable for us. But I'm a little worried because, you know, we do this every Sunday night. We have a pretty solid routine. It's moving forward well, but True Detective starts next Sunday night. So I may have to reexamine my priorities as far as talking to you two. This could be the yeah. end of the Kids Seriously show. And the Royal Rumble's in two weeks, too. And because I still haven't figured out how to cancel WWE Network from when I got it last year, I'm probably going to wind up watching that, too, and ditching both of you. Nice, nice. Well, is Red Rooster still in it? Because I remember that time he was in it for like <laughs> yes, seven Yes, and he's seconds. already out of it. <laughs> nice. That sounds about right for him. How about you, Maya? Good, and you? I, I'm still good from when you asked me 30 seconds ago and I said I was good. Not so bad. True Detective's starting. Oh, we're doing this now. <laughs> Should we get right to Jared Kiesel's favorite game show? It's Am I Right or Am I Wrong? Beats fighting guys with treasure trails. <laughs> In true Canadian style, our contestant will offer up earnest opinions, which will either be taken as fact or immediately coddled by our moderator. Here's how our two-player version game thing works. These There's going to be seven questions, I think. Each brawler goes back and forth in a serpentine way, not unlike the snakes fought by St. Patrick. And how can we respect this game if we don't even respect St. Patrick? The winner gets four. You have to get four, darn it. Who's running this drama tonight? Yo, know, that would be me. I have a series of questions I'm about to administer if you gentlemen are ready. Sure. Okay. Well, that was one of you. I, I'm ready. Okay. I, I can't see you, so I, I need verbal cues. I didn't even give you one of those. I was just, I'm in my own. He's just home. brimming with enthusiasm. You just mm. can't see it through the, the wires. Okay. And so Luke is currently up two to nothing over my. <laughs> yes. Okay. Now, um, I wrote these actually last week in, in preparation for last week's um, game before I got sick and had to bow out. So this, this first reference here is a little not exactly topical, but, you know, just go with it. All right. All three of us are MLS fans, and the MLS community uh, suffered a pretty big loss um, with the death of uh, former Sounders, Columbus Crew, and LA Galaxy head coach, Siggy Schmidt, one of the legends of uh, U.S. soccer, and one of the men very responsible for really developing MLS into a viable league. Hated the teams he played for, but... You know, you've got to respect everything that he did for the game. So this got me thinking about celebrity deaths. And my question to you is, in your lifetime, what has been the most personally impactful celebrity death? And that's that's going to start with me. Uh, I, I'm, yeah, right? That starts with me. Sure. Okay. So I know the obvious answer that I, I could say that's the Minnesota answer would be to say Prince, but that would that would be a lie, even though... As far as celebrity deaths go, I was sad about that one because Prince means a lot to Minnesota. But for me, the the person who died that that I was I'm the saddest about is Tom Petty. Um, that's my second favorite musician. That's my my favorite live act that I ever saw. I saw him six or seven times live. I got to see him play two shows back to back nights with Pearl Jam. So that's my two favorite artists playing back to back shows and. It was the, you know, I'm not one of those people who goes, oh, there's a celebrity I've never met. You know, my my life's totally affected because they're gone. But it it gave me a lot of sadness to think I'm never going to see him live again. Because going and seeing him live brought me so much joy throughout 
the years and I'll never get to do that again. And that, that made me sad. So for me, it's, it's Tom Petty. My answer comes not far from Tom Petty. In fact, the two gentlemen were in the same band, the Traveling Wilburys. For me, my answer is George Harrison. I was a huge Beatles fan growing up, a gigantic Beatles fan, where I would go weeks with that. That was the only band I would listen to, and George Harrison is one of my favorite songwriters of all time. And every time I listen to it, doesn't you know, without fail, I kind of think of how messed up that is that we've only got two more Beatles or two Beatles left, and they're the ones that I don't particularly care for. My favorite still left. Okay. Well, now both of those are actually really good answers. Um, well, as I was crafting this question, I realized I didn't have a right answer. I just had a wrong answer. Was and the wrong Reggie answer White? for either of you to give would have been Kurt Cobain because that's such an obnoxious 90s cliche. for uh, one. Just... I think I was too young, too, because I was in. I, I remember I found out about him dying on a school bus. So that was like eighth grade, I think, for me. So I think seventh I was, grade for you it was so, April fourteenth, I think, uh, nineteen ninety four. Okay, Somewhere. so uh, yeah, I, I found out on the, I was too young for that to really affect okay. me. I think. Well, good. Neither of you picked the wrong answer. So um, I am going to go with. I'm going to give this one to Maya. And the only reason I'm going to give it to Maya is because I'm willing to bet that music is a bigger part of, of his life and his understanding than it is for you, Luke. So I'm going to concede that that would be probably a bigger impact for him. Though I, I am with you as far as I relate to Tom Petty being dead a lot more. The, the only thing I will concede that, and I think that is fair, other than the fact you're not taking in how big a music lover I am. I'm such a big music lover that I once caught a guitar pick from Sugar Ray at a concert. They performed with every last. <laughs> he did play jump around though. We have one point to Maya, zero points to Luke going into question. Number two, piggybacking off question. Number one, what celebrity who is currently alive? Do you know that you are not emotionally capable of handling when they die? And this will be to Maya first. Wow, that's a great question, and it's going to be a deep dive, and it's a guy that I know that you don't respect very much, so I'll just take my uh, my my chances, because that's the way I play this game, and the honest truth, the person who, when he dies, I will take it the hardest, is Tom York from Radiohead. If there is another band that I care about as much as the Beatles, and one that realistically surpassed, one that I saw live, it was, it was Radiohead, and Tom York, I think... Um, whether you talk about his lyrics politically, you talk about the music and, or you just talk about the things that he and his band have done in the music industry and the way that they've conducted themselves. I absolutely love Tom York. And that one's going to, that, that one will be worse than George Harrison. I'm, I'm surprised you didn't, I would thought you would have gone Malcolm S on that instead. That's what I was gearing up for. But um, so for, for me, it's, it's not going to be music. I've actually gotten to the point where I, I've kind of realized that if my favorite, not that I want them to die, but like if my favorite band, if Pearl Jam announced they broke up tomorrow, I think I'd be okay with that. Like I've seen them enough live. They've done enough. There's enough albums. There's enough music that, and I'm old enough where I think I'd be kind of fine with that if that, if that happened. So it, it's, it's not going to be music for me, even though I've gotten a lot of an enjoyment out of them. Um, but for me, I think the what it's going to be is it's it's going to be someone who meant a lot to me through my childhood and into my early adulthood um and that's that's Steve Eiserman who is my all-time favorite athlete I was a massive Detroit Red Wing fan when we had no hockey team in Minnesota to cheer for and he was my favorite player and that started at a young age in middle school and I was a kid who I collected hockey cards and back in the day when there wasn't really internet I would get the Beckett magazine that had all the the names in it or, or all the addresses of the stadiums and you would get those and you would mail your hockey cards to the stadiums of the players you wanted and you'd include a self-addressed stamped envelope and maybe 35% of them would send the card back autographed, which is pretty sweet. And I, Wayne Gretzky sent me one and Mario Lemieux. Um, I sent seven cards to Steve Eiserman. He signed them all. He, he won two Stanley cups. Um, my junior and senior year of high school, no sophomore and uh, junior year of high school, which meant more to me than any sports championship I've ever experienced a team of 
mine when I remember being really, really sad when he retired, just thinking I'll never see him on the ice again. And I don't know him personally or whatever, but he just reminds me of happy times. So when that announcement comes one day that he's no longer there, it'll just be like, oh, that a guy who I'll never meet, never talk to, never any of that, but who just brought me so much joy throughout my life, especially when I was younger. Uh, th- th- I think that'll be the toughest one for me. Okay. Well, much like the first question, there was no right answer. There was only the wrong answer. And the wrong answer was, of course, Paul McCartney, because he's a hack. That's my favorite, Um, Beto. Yeah, he would be. Much like I I gave Maya the point on the first one, because I I played up the, uh, I understood the importance of music to him. I think we can also say that hockey is equally important to Luke. He also had a personal anecdote in there. So I'm going to take those two factors, and I'm giving the point to Luke. We are officially tied at 1-1. To be fair, you're right. There's nothing fair about this. No, you're right. (laughs) Question number three. So I recently spent my first Christmas here in Portland, and it was nice. We didn't have relatives for the first time in 18 years, so we actually got to spend it, just my, my lovely bride and I. And that's rare because... With my family living all over the country, basically every Christmas, I have to rotate going to their various houses, right? And it's a well-known fact to the you know dozens of fans of this podcast that both of you live in the greater Milwaukee area. It's also no secret to anybody who knows me that I don't exactly feel like traveling to the Milwaukee area on a, a regular basis because it's Wisconsin. So... Each of you have to live somewhere outside of Wisconsin that I'm going to come visit you for Christmas next year. Where would you live and why? Probably. If I'm going to be living somewhere else and I'm just going to be grand fantasizing. I mean, if I was to pick a place in the U.S., I'd live in Seattle because it's beautiful and I love mountains and I love forests. But if we're opening up the the whole world in... All right. Well, no, let's let's just keep it in the U.S. Keep it in the U.S.? Okay, yeah. then, then, I'll, then I'll say that I would move to Seattle. I, I haven't been to Portland, um, but I went to Seattle, you know, a year and a half ago. And it, it has everything I love in a, a big city, both geographically and cultural-wise. You have the mountains, but then you have the evergreen forest, and then you have the ocean, and you have whales going by, and everyone is really friendly, and they ride their bikes, and they compost everything, and, you know, they don't, you know, shoot their black people like they do here in Milwaukee, and um, I thought it was a really fun city to walk around. There was a really vibrant culture. You know, you're close to Vancouver, you're close to Portland, and other great cities that you can go visit. Uh, I love Seattle, and then, Mark... To throw on a bonus for you is you could day trip it to my house for Christmas, still sleep in your own bed and escape other relatives you might not want to see that are visiting. Okay, interesting. Maya. Mark, for my answer, this would be the place that I would move. And in fact, uh, when Boom Madrid is done with school, I may consider moving. And that city is somewhere I lived before. It's Albuquerque, New Mexico. Let me tell you the reason that you want to come visit me in Albuquerque. First of all, it's going to be far warmer than Seattle. Uh, There's more days of sunshine in Albuquerque, New New Mexico than any other city with the exception of San Diego in the United States. Additionally... um, That's something that's going to be really important to you, given your problems with Portland's continual rain, which you're just going to get more of if you go to Seattle. Now, the other the other thing that I want to treat you to is New Mexico has the most underrated food in the entire United States with um, basically it's it's like a Spanish uh, Mexican food mix with heavy on green chili. And uh, the sunsets are the absolute best in the maybe in the entire world. That's what it's known for. So the most underrated city is where I'd want to live, Albuquerque, New Mexico. P- plus, he'd throw a pizza on that guy's roof. <laughs> Did you actually threw the pizza on the roof? No. Oh, come on, guys. Um, that, that house... No, in- I didn't oh, right. oh, okay. I was wondering if he actually did it. He stared at me confused, so I don't think I, no, he put I just, it together. No, it's Breaking Bad. I got it. it was a yeah, because I, I guess that house is actually there, and the, the owners have real problems that tourists will come and throw pizza on their roof. Oh, right. Gosh. That's why I, I yeah. thought you meant he actually did it. No, so, I didn't live in that part of the town. I would just to see the point if he actually did it. Yeah. So, okay. Or concede the point, one of the two. First things first, uh, Luke, I would have bet Maya's left nut that you were going to pick Boston. So I'm a little surprised and and thrown for a curve that you picked Seattle. I like Seattle Uh, more since I went there. 
Yeah, it, it's it's definitely a town. But I'm going to be honest with you, Maya had me at Green Chilies. So nice. Albuquerque, yes. Point to Maya. So we are now two to one. I was also I was also slightly hedging that Maya was going to say L.A. and then I would just win based on him saying well, L.A. So yeah, but everybody's been to L.A. Like no one goes to Albuquerque. No one knows That's the true. treasure of how great yeah. that town is. That is true. Okay. So question number four. The trailer for Us came out uh, last week or the weekend, week before. I've, I've lost track of, of time now, which is Jordan Peele's sophomore effort and already looks to be uh, pretty terrifying and exciting, and uh, I can't wait to see it. So in this vein, I'm wondering, what is the best sophomore effort ever by a director? The best one that I like commercials and I'm at a I'm at a huge disadvantage, obviously, because I've got two guys who know a lot about music. But what I'm just gonna guess, because I think and hope it was his his sophomore effort, is Alex Garland's Ex Machina. That was one of my favorite movies of all time, and I'm just shooting from the hip. And already, I just realized that the dude from Sicario probably was his sophomore effort, and I just screwed that up. But I'm gonna go Alex Garland Ex Machina. It's actually it's Annihilation. Damn. Ex Machina is his first Damn it. directorial right. movie. I'm I'm pretty sure about. All right. Well, so so Maya's already lost the point, but if we're going to keep this fair. Luke has to get what I've written down in order for him to get the point. Because there's oh. an obvious answer. Okay. Well, because c- uh, um, for for me, it's Memento by Christopher Nolan, which is not probably what you had written down, but that's his second movie after following. And I think that to this day is still his best movie and probably the best movie of this, arguably the best movie of the century. It's one of my favorite movies of this century. It's, it's a fantastic effort. I almost went with the lobster, which is a movie I, I absolutely love, but actually that's probably his third or fourth movie. Cause he did some movies in Greece first. So I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go with my honest answer, which is Christopher Nolan's Memento. Yeah, it was it was a noble effort, and it it might have won had there not been a, an obvious number one answer, and that is Steven Spielberg's Jaws. That is the greatest second movie ever made by a director. I actually just saw. I have no excuse because I just thought, saw that this past summer within the last six months. So I'm embarrassed. I apologize to you, your families, and anybody listening to the show. So what was his first one? Is that Duel? Duel. Duel, okay. Yeah, that's pretty good, I guess. Yeah. All right. Question number five. Oh, so to recap, uh, we have uh, Maya 2, Luke 1, and uh, a dead point out there. Question number five. Recently saw Into the Spider-Verse, which was an absolutely amazing movie. Everybody should go see it. Drop what you're doing and get to the theater now. Don't wait till it's out on video. See it on a giant screen. Um, and, and one of the small treasures of that movie was Nicolas Cage and his voice work as the noir Spider-Man. Uh, it was completely unexpected, utterly charming. And that made me think about celebrities whose careers were dead and then had great comebacks. I mean, I think that the, the pinnacle of this was John Travolta in Pulp Fiction coming back from Look Who's Talking 8 – in, in Greece for and to having a rebirth and a renaissance of a career that he then began to piss away again with Battlefield Earth leading into you know such tragedies as Gotti. I'm wondering who is the next actor who is primed for a major career comeback? Well, f- first off, I just want to go back to the last point because Jaws is actually his third movie. So you wanted to say that Sugarland Express in 1974 is the best sophomore effort, I guess, of all time, which, you know, is a movie we all know and love. It stars Goldie Hawn as a woman attempting to reunite her family by helping her uh, husband escape a prison together with their son. So I know that's what you actually meant to say, and you misspoke and said Jaws Fake when news. I lost that point. But Fake news. Fake news. Ev- everyone should go see Sugarland Express because... Uh, that that is a really a really fantastic movie. I guess I'm just gonna have to try to throw out a completely bullshit answer that uh, I don't think anyone else is gonna gonna have. But you know, I think Fred Willard was really derailed by the masturbating in theaters scandal and us running out of momentum for Christopher Guest movies. 
And uh, we haven't seen him in a while, at least in anything mainstream. We know he's got the talent and the chops for anything you want, comedy-wise. So I'm I'm going to throw out there that uh, that we're we're due to see a little bit more Fred Willard in our life, and just hope we don't encounter him in the movie theater itself. Originally, when I was going to answer this question, I was going to go with David Spade, and the reason that I was going to go with David Spade is I do think he actually is talented and can be funny at times the problem with david spade is he doesn't get enough work to actually make a comeback and i don't think that he ever will and so as i was sitting there through luke's long monologue i got to thinking about snl in the 1990s and i tried to think of who would actually shock me okay so at this point we couldn't see it coming it would have to be the worst actor out there and i'm gonna go with netflix's baby Adam Sandler. If Adam Sandler was to turn the tables on this mess that he has made of his career, it would be truly shocking and truly awe-inspiring, and I think it would do the world a hell of a lot of good. Adam Sandler is my choice. Okay. So my answer was famed actor Dennis Quaid, because I've been really impressed lately with his insurance commercials. (laughs) But I am giving the point to Luke, not because I think Fred Willard is ever going to become an A-list star like John Travolta or, or Josh Brolin or, or Nicolas Cage, but just because I refuse to live in a world where Adam Sandler's career isn't dead. <laughs> I was feeling pretty good when when for, when he first started going down the David Spade track. I was like, I got I got the inside route on this now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Question number six. Now I saw this on Twitter from a, a person uh, named Sarah Benicasa. Um, so I, I have no relationship. I don't follow her, nothing, but this was her tweet and I saw it and I thought, Hey, this is a good question. So I'm stealing it. Credit where credit is due. You can, either of you murder one totally fictional literary character. Now I don't not, we're not talking about the author or an actor who plays them in a movie, but the actual literary character. So if you could kill them and they, they stay dead and then they're basically erased from literature, right? Oh. You never have to, you never have to see this character again. You never have to read the book with them in it. Why not? Who are you killing and why? Luke's immediately at a disadvantage because this involves reading. <laughs> at least I don't have to go first. I really want to do a twofer and kill both of the people in the, in the couple for the, the Fifty Shades of Grey group, but since I can't pick two, I'm just going to pick the dude because that movie and that book is god-awful, and I'm immediately killing myself because I, I wanted to, or I should have picked Twilight, So, but wait, I'm going wait, Fifty, wait, wait, Shades, wait. Fifty Shades of Grey. He, he, halfway, yeah, through, halfway through the answer, I had to like stop, and then yeah, Fifty Shades of Grey, I answered it, but it, it, it should have been Twilight. Wait, so your answer is the dude from, from Big Lebowski? No, it's from Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh, the dude from Fifty Shades yes. okay, of Grey. Not, Anna, not Anastasia Steele. The okay. love interest. It's whoever Christian Grey. Grey. Christian Grey, yes. Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I, 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 For a second there, I thought you were referring to Jeffrey Lebowski, at which point you would have immediately lost, and I never would have played this game with you again. I don't so, think he's a okay. literary character either. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm going a different route, and while I respect Maya's answer because that is a terrible everything, I think we're done. Like I think I don't think that's coming back. I don't think there's going to be more of that. I think I think that entire thing is wrapped up and done. We've survived the storm, and we can move on. So I'm gonna go to something that keeps getting done over and over and over, and. Really, I don't think it's been done well in a long time. I don't think it initially was done that well. The best version is probably a Disney version where they substituted everyone with ducks. So I'm going to get rid of Ebenezer Scrooge from Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol because I I, I think Dickens is kind of a shit author from the things I had to read. We know he's not a big fan of, of women as people. And uh, I, I'm so tired of having three Jim Carrey versions and touring Christmas plays that my in-laws take me to and, and all these different versions of something that's never going to go away. We're going to keep seeing it. So I'm, I'm going to knock that character out uh, and, and wipe the slate clean, even okay. if I have to sacrifice Scrooge McDuck. My camera isn't working, so you'll just have to take my word for this, that Luke, you and I just had a Stanley Tucci moment. Are you serious? That is what I wrote down because I hate A Christmas Carol. 
Wow! Yes, I am so sick of that story being done every year. Oh, oh. Your answer was good, Maya. Don't get me wrong. But I, I, I have to go with it if he gets what I wrote down. Yeah, you know what? You know what? It's the uh it's the subliminal conditioning of having our parents take us every year to the Guthrie to see it, I think is Good God, both of us. I well, that's awesome. <laughs> All right, so uh, Luke uh, takes the lead. It's now uh, three to two, and we're coming up on question number seven. There was a no point question, Maya. Yeah. So I've secured a tie. Okay. I just almost knocked the table over. That would have been some good broadcasting. All right, so last week the lineup for Coachella was announced, and I have never felt all 42 of my years as when I was reading through this list of a bunch of people who I've never heard of, and my old man grumpy brain things are going to be shit and no one will hear about them in 20 years. So I was very, very disappointed. In fact, there's only two acts I even know about. Um, one obviously is Childish Gambino, who I, I dig his music, but he always strikes me more as a, as a performance artist as opposed to a musician. And so you kind of have to see the videos and everything. And I don't know that just seeing him on a stage is really something I'd be interested in. Okay. The second act that I actually knew is only because I'm a big Stringer Bell fan from The Wire, and that's Idris Elba, who apparently has two DJ sets, because apparently Idris Elba is also a DJ. So this got me thinking big about fan. other celebrities who have fun facts or hidden talents that we don't know about, um, something that the general public isn't aware of but would blow your mind if you heard it. So thinking of in that vein, what is... The most surprising, interesting, fascinating, whatever, fun fact that people wouldn't normally know about a celebrity that you're aware of. And this this starts with me? Uh, yeah, it's seven. So, yeah, it's an odd so, number. Yes. So it starts with me. So a, a surprising uh, celebrity fact that I know. Um, oh, man, I have one that I was going to go with, but I can't remember the exact details on it. So I think I, I'm going to... I'm going to butcher it if I, if I, oh, I'm just going to go. I was going to go with that Mar Mariska Hargitay was in the car uh, with James Mansfield when James Mansfield killed her or died in a car accident, which is pretty good. But I'm going to go with the fact that, uh, that uh, Candace Bergen was supposed to be at the party at Sharon Tate's house the night they were murdered by the Manson family and ended up not going. And I, I think she was either friends or she was dating one of someone that was involved or th there was some there was a, a connection where Candace Bergen was supposed to be there that night and then ended up not going so we would have lost all those episodes of Murphy Brown if she had made a different decision and been in that house that night and what would the Republicans have bitched about back then oh, no idea My well I don't know a lot about uh, celebrities but I know the greatest celebrity around this table is one Maya Madrid and once in the year well actually I'm not going to say the year or the city Yours truly once ran for mayor of his hometown. Did you win? No, I got my ass kicked. <laughs> wow. Both are such good answers for, for different <laughs> reasons. So many so many things are just swirling through my head right now. Um, I'm actually going to um, award the point to Maya because that is pretty sweet. Uh, and, and, my actual answer was, answer was Julia Child, who was actually an OSS agent uh, during World War II, uh, the OSS being a precursor to the CIA. So America's favorite old lady friend, Shep, was a freaking spy during the war, and she worked with them on developing shark repellent. Which Batman we, later we, utilized. We <laughs> could later save Batman's life in the 60s. So that was my answer. But... Uh, Maya himself running for mayor is pretty freaking cool. So That's he gets cool. the point. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a tie. Wah, wah. It's, it's like a tie. Kiss, Everybody kissing your wins. sister. Because you get a kiss. But it's your... Oh, we're stopping now. It's your sister. 